Welcome to the Servants of Grace podcast hosted by Dave Jenkins. Our podcast exists to provide trustworthy expository messages through the Bible and faithful answers to your theology questions. Now for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. All right, guys. Well, welcome back to the Servants of Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this show. And today we're going to continue our study through the book of Psalms, looking today at Psalm 16. Would you please join me now in prayer? Father, as we open your word today, we are thankful that this is the truth, that it can be known that we don't have to search around in the dark to know God, because you have revealed yourself in your word. So Lord, we, we thank you. We thank you that you are a God who has revealed himself, and so you can be known. And we, we're so thankful for that, Lord, because as we come to this text, we're, we're about to be re- instructed That there is genuine joy in a world of chaos. And so, Lord, I I pray that as we look at this text, we would would be instructed that you would use your word. Thank you that it it will not return without void. That you will use it for the aim in which you intend to open eyes and ears to Christ alone. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us. Help us to know you. Help us to taste and see that the Lord is good and that your mercy endures forever. We thank you, Lord, for this time that you've given to us to open your word. Please use this time in our lives to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Savior and our King. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them to Psalm 16. Psalm 16. The title of our study today is an Easter Psalm. Psalm 16, starting with verse 1, says this. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offering of blood I will not pour out, or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen on pleasant places for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance." I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life and in your presence there is fullness of joy At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. This is the reading of God's precious word. Psalm 16 is famous, very, very famous, because the apostles preached the resurrection of Jesus in the New Testament from this psalm. When Peter preached at Pentecost, that Jesus had been raised from the dead, he quoted Psalm 16, 8 through 11. Acts 2, 25 through 28 says this, For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand, that I might not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced, my, my flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades. Let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You'll make me full of gladness with your presence. Peter argues that that David could not have been talking about himself. Why? Because David was still dead. His body did see corruption. His muscles, his skin, his tissues rotted away 
and turned to dust over the centuries. And so Peter concluded that David must have been speaking on behalf of Christ, who did not stay in the tomb and who did not decay. Acts 2, 30-32 says, Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. And as Peter applied Psalm 16 to the Lord Jesus, the crowd in Jerusalem heard him, and 3,000 people believed on the name of the Lord Jesus. Well, it wasn't only Peter that preached this. The Apostle Paul also preached the resurrection of Jesus from this same psalm. And speaking to Jews in Antioch, Paul said this in Acts 13, 32 through uh, 37, saying this, And we bring you the good news that what God promised to the fathers, this he has fulfilled to us, their children, by raising Jesus. He said also in another psalm, You will not let your Holy One see corruption. You see, for David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, he fell asleep, he was laid down with his fathers and saw corruption. But he whom God raised up did not see corruption. Paul read Psalm 16 the same way that Peter did. Both apostles followed the same path of logic, and yet David could not have been talking about himself because he died. His body rotted in the grave. But Jesus rose again before the process of decay could even set in. And since David was a prophet, he must have been speaking for the Lord Jesus. This fits in with the New Testament as a whole. The apostles were convinced that Jesus' death and resurrection was prophesied in the Old Testament. 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4 says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Now, Psalm 16 is one of those passages the apostles used to teach the resurrection of Jesus in accordance with the Scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4. My friends, this is an Easter psalm. And since Dave was speaking for Christ, Psalm 16 gives us a window into the heart of Jesus. When David says, me and I in this psalm, he's speaking for Jesus, the great Son of God. Psalm 16 records Jesus' thoughts as he lived his earthly life and walked his hard road to the cross. In fact, when we read the Gospels, Jesus' courage as he faced death, his sheer guts is absolutely amazing. He was fully human like we are. How could he have been so brave as he was about to be killed? What was going on in his heart? What was he praying when no one else was around? How could he be sure he would rise again? Jesus was fully human. He had the full range of thoughts and emotions as a human. And yet he was fully God. And Psalm 16 gives us a window into the soul of Jesus, fully God and fully man. This is how the real man, Jesus, strengthened his soul as he faced the cross. The Holy Spirit inspired this Easter psalm so we could strengthen our souls in Christ. We might be facing some trial, some hardship that shakes our shakes us to our very core. Jesus' thoughts need to be our thoughts. His feelings need to become our feelings He's the Son of God and the Son of Man. As David speaks for Christ, this psalm expresses his commitment in the first three verses, his contentment in verses 4 through 8, his confidence in verses 9 through 11. You see, commitment to God brings contentment in God that leads to confidence in God. David first, first commits himself fully to God. He trusts God to protect him like the Secret Service agent protects the president. He trusts God to provide every good thing. There's there's no plan B in this kind of commitment. If God does not come through for him, he is finished. This is the sort of commitment where faith in God begins. And so he commits himself to God for physical 
protection. Psalm 16, verse 1 says, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. Now, the word preserve, it means to keep watch, to keep or to watch over. As a shepherd, David watched over the sheep, protecting them from danger in 1 Samuel 17, 34 through 36. And David now is asking God to watch over him with the care and the concern of a shepherd. This is the only petition he makes in this psalm. He doesn't make any other requests. David expected God to take care for him because he was taking refuge in God. Like a soldier crouching beneath his shield, David crouches behind God. Like children running to their parents' room at night, David runs to God. Psalm 15, 5 promises that the godly man will never be shaken. David is banking that God will keep this promise. God will wrap his arms around him and be his refuge. It is striking here that David runs to God like this because he was a strong man. After all, as a teenager, he slung that stone at Goliath with a sling and a stone, and Goliath fell. When he was an officer in Saul's army, the people had chanted, Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his ten thousands in 1 Samuel 18, verse 7. David led a guerrilla war for several years. His army in the desert of Judea was like our special forces. On the throne, David was a shrewd diplomat as king. If ever there was a man who could take care of himself, it was David. Trusting God, though, is the manly thing to do. Taking refuge in God is the last thing for, for weak men and sissies, right? A coward's way, we think, to avoid responsibility. The American ideal is that real men take care of themselves. We're, so we're taught as men to be self-reliant. After all, we think only weak men turn to God and trust him. But just the opposite is true. It takes immense courage and strong faith in God to say what David says in verse 1, Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. The warrior and the statements banked everything on God's protection. And now David, David committed himself to God because he was convinced that God is good. And even more, there's nothing good that's not from God. Verse 2 says, I say to the Lord, you are my God. I have no good apart from you. It's, it's important for every single Christian to be convinced that the God we serve is good. And what's more, we need to understand that only God is good. We can't let ourselves ever imagine that there is even a slight sliver of good apart from God and his will for our lives that is good. James 1, 16 through 17 says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. There is no good gift that doesn't come from God. The essence of sin is looking for good outside of God's provision, outside of God's will. That's what idolatry is. As seeking to find meaning and value and worth in the things of the world instead of the treasure that is found in God himself. This is why a young woman aims to, aims to find a man, find a boyfriend. Because what she wants first and foremost is to find someone so she isn't alone. And what, what is she doing? She's looking for a good thing, namely love and security, but apart from God and his will for her life. This is why a man indulges in pornography and sexual promiscuity or even an office romance. He's looking for a good thing, namely sexual pleasure. He's looking, but he's looking for it apart from God. God's way in that instance is through monogamous heterosexual sex. Marriage between one man and one woman for life. A woman tells her friends the latest gossip to make her feel even more significant. What's she doing? She wants a good thing. She wants to feel like she matters, that she's important. And she should feel precious because God created her in his image and Christ died to redeem her. But instead, she bases her significance 
on having the latest juicy news. She's looking for good apart from God. An unforgiving man craves justice, a good thing, but he takes revenge in his own hands. God says in Deuteronomy 32, 35, vengeance is mine. A greedy person clings to possession for security instead of taking refuge in God. In fact, John Calvin said it this way, it will not suffice simply to hold that there is one whom all ought to honor and adore unless we are persuaded that he is the fountain of every good and that we must seek nothing elsewhere than in him. For until men recognize that they owe everything to God, that they are nourished in his fatherly care, that he is the author of their every good, that they should seek nothing beyond him, that they will never yield him willing service. Nay, unless they establish their complete happiness in him, they will never give themselves truly and sincerely to him. You see, you cannot commit yourself to the biblical God unless you believe that God is good and that only God is good. This is David's commitment here. And this is Jesus' commitment, and Jesus is fully God and fully man. And furthermore, as disciples of Christ, as learners of Christ, this must be our commitment as well. David's commitment continued with his love for his people in verse 3. As for the saints in the land, they are excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. And this follows the spirit of Psalm 15, verse 4, where we read that the godly man honors those who fear the Lord. If we love God, we will love his people. 1 John 5, 1. Everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. You see, the towering faith of Psalm 16 starts with David's commitment to God and his people. And yet it continues, David's commitment is followed by his contentment. See, trusting God is not a life sentence of misery and loneliness. You see, if you are making a commitment to the Lord through faith in, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, you are choosing a life and joy in God himself. David could not be more delighted with the way that God cared for him and blessed him with his presence. See, his contentment starts with the refusal in verse 4. The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. Their drink offering of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. Being happy with God starts with saying no. You cannot be happy and satisfied in God if you're riding the fence. You cannot have it both ways. Some people wonder why they can't find genuine joy in Christ, but they have a foot in each world. They want God to bless them, but they're living for themselves too. They hedge their bets. What they're doing is, is they're living for themselves. Jesus even says, you cannot have two masters. Either you will serve me or serve the other. You see, that's what idolatry is. It, 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 it requests everything. It takes from us genuine joy. That's why at the very end of 1 John 5, in 1 John 5, John, his last words, little children, keep yourselves from idols. This is why Proverbs 4.23 tells us to guard our hearts with all due diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. And yet David knows better. He will have nothing to do with pagan sacrifices. He will not worship by pouring out the blood of their sacrifices. He will not pray to their gods, finding joy and satisfaction in God means saying no. And instead, David says yes to God. David would, would not take the names of other gods on his lips because he does not take Yahweh's name on his lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. Behold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Psalm 16, 5 through 6 says, David's contentment was in none other than in God himself. His blessings hang on four words that stand out in these verses. Portion, lot, lines, inheritance in verses 5 through 6. And these four words, they point back to the time when Joshua divided the land between the 12 tribes after the conquest of Canaan. Canaan. Each tribe was given its portion of the land by lot with clear boundary lines demarking the borders of their land 
This land was their inheritance to be passed down through the generations. One tribe did not receive a portion of the land. God said to the Levites in Numbers 18.20, You shall have no inheritance in their land, neither shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of Israel. You see, the priests and the Levites did not have the security of their own tribal area. They had to rely on God for their safety. And David is claiming this same close relationship with God. True safety and true security does not come from property and possessions. It comes from knowing God. It comes from living in his presence. And what a heritage this is. He is blessed with God himself. God himself is David's inheritance. God gives many precious blessings to his people, but make, makes them truly good is having God himself. David says this in Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing have I asked of the Lord that I may that I will, I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Asaph says this in Psalm 73, 25 through 26, whom, I, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Now hear me when I say this. Because we are living in a time, friends, where we have to be very, very clear about what I'm about to say. So I'm going to preface it by saying this. We are living in a time when people think that they can have a little bit of God and a little bit of themselves. We call this the self-help movement. The self-love movement. It's all about me. It, it, even in the last few years, we have the Me Too movement. You see what the point is? Self. You have the prosperity gospel, which is all about how I can be healthy and wealthy and happy. But we need to say something, and it's really, really important that you get this point. Because it's critical to your Christian life and growth in the grace of God. You see, the greatest blessing that God can give us is he gives us himself. You see, if we do not have God, then there is no other gift that he gives that means anything. You see, if God gave you health, but he didn't give you himself, would you be satisfied? If God gave you a nice home, nice vacations, plenty of money, but did not give you himself, would you be satisfied? If, if, if God healed that family member or that friend or that famous Christian leader, would you be satisfied in him? If you went to heaven and the streets were solid gold, the air was clean and bright, and there was no more sin, everyone got along without fighting, without arguing, without conflict, but Jesus was not there, would you be satisfied? God himself is the one great blessing that makes all the other things he gives worthwhile. Think of the greatest blessings you have as a Christian. God's forgiven you on account of the perfect righteousness of Christ. And why is that good news? Forgiveness is good because God has removed the guilt that separated you from him. Justification is good news because Christ gives us access to the presence of God. Eternal life is good news because it means seeing Jesus and enjoying his presence forever and ever. The great blessing that God gives is himself. David's heart was not set on the gifts God gave him. God was David's portion. You see, God is enough in and of himself. And even though the greatest gifts God gives us is himself, we shouldn't look down on his other blessings. One way we love God is by enjoying the good gifts that he gives. He gives us friends. He gives us a local church. He gives us, if you're married, he gave you your spouse. And on, he gave you the house that you live in, the apartment that you live in. He gave you the job that you have. He gave you the talents and the abilities and the education. He gave you the experiences that you have. David praises God for the two great gifts that God's presence brings. God's counsel and God's support. Psalm 16, 7 through 8 says, I, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. 
I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. You see, God gives David advice throughout the day and throughout the night. This is a reality that is even more real for us under the new covenant than it was for David. God has placed his heart, his Holy Spirit inside of us, and he has written his law on his heart. Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34 says this, that. James 1, 5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. And yet God also stands beside him to strengthen him and support him. And this is the closing promise of Psalm 16. The godly man or woman will never be shaken. God's support is a new covenant reality for every single believer. Matthew 28, 20 says, I am with you always to the end of the age. Many Christians have felt God's support as, as he stood beside them. Paul described it this way in 2 Timothy 4, 16 through 17. At my defense, no one came to stand beside me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might hear it. And so I was rescued from the lion's mouth. Commitment and contentment lead to confidence. Faith follows from setting our hearts fully on God and being satisfied in him. So David sings now about his confidence in the resurrection in Psalm 16, 9 through 10, saying this, Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let the, your Holy One see corruption. As the apostles preached, this was the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ as he faced the cross. Speaking through David, Jesus saw that he must die, but his body would not remain in the tomb to rot and decay. Jesus also said to his disciples during his early, early, earthly life in Mark 9, 31, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men and they will kill him. And when he is killed, after three days, he will rise. This, friends, is amazing confidence. And better yet, it is true. God did not abandon Jesus to the grave, but raised him up on the third day. And everyone who is in Christ has this sort of faith, as Jesus did. We trust God in the face of death. We believe on the basis of God's character and his word that he will not abandon us to the grave. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 52 says this, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will, will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. If you are a believer, you know that death is not the end. It was not the end for Jesus and it's not going to be the end for you. In John 14, 26, Jesus says that he goes ahead to prepare a place for you. You see, when, when Jesus says in John 19, 30, it is finished. This is when the kingdom began. This is when Jesus was beginning that to fulfill that promise that he goes to prepare a place for you. That is, when he died and he was buried and he rose again on the third day, that promise was beginning to be fulfilled. That place, that home that he is speaking of, it's the place where we belong as Christians. It's our real home. It's our real inheritance. And it's not because of us. It's because of Christ. It's because of his person. It's because of his work. Even, even in John 19.30, Jesus says it is finished. It is signed. It is sealed. It's delivered in the blood of our Savior King, who paid the penalty in our place and for our sin. Without this, there is no hope. There is no joy. And yet people are living for themselves as, as Solomon testified in Ecclesiastes 3. That there's a season for this and a season for that and a season for this. This is the way so many people live today. They live for the moment. They live for pleasure. They live 
for their job. But what's going to satisfy? Will getting published be satisfied? Will, will getting that article satisfy you? Will having kids satisfy you? Will getting that degree satisfy you? Will doing that one trip that, that you want to do, will that satisfy you? My friend, hear me when I say this, and I'm going to say it very clearly. You will never, ever be satisfied in life until you are satisfied, and I mean satisfied, in God. And you can never, ever be satisfied in God until you've settled the question, settled the issue of who you think Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Because you see, the whole Bible from from Genesis 3 on is concerned with the question of who is Jesus and what is Jesus going to do? We see this everywhere in between Genesis 3 to Genesis 22. It culminates in Revelation 21 and 22, but the, the issue is, what are you going to do with Jesus? Because that is a question of internal significance. If you're going to have joy now and pleasure now, you're not going to have joy and pleasure forevermore in God. And you're never going to be content in God. Even though Paul says in, in Philippians 4, he was content in every situation. Why? Because he found his joy in God. That's why, that's why if you go <coughs> to Philippians 4.2, for one and two, that's why he bookends. He starts with joy, and he says, I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. It's not because of him. It's not because of that he's somehow a super Christian. And so he, he's just so joyful and so happy. No, what Paul was joyful about was about the sufficiency of Christ. He had found his joy in God. As a Christian, you, you've had your heart of stone replaced with a new heart, with new desires and new affections for him. And, and the book of James is very clear that we are not to love the world. We are not to be friends with the world. Friendship with the world, according to James 4, is, is enmity with God. It's at odds. Jesus says you'll either love me or you'll love the world. There's no other option. That's why Jesus says that we are to love him with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our strength. And we can only do this because of the abounding grace of God, because of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. Now, David ends with a positive statement of his confidence. Not only will God deliver him from death, but he will bless him with life in his presence. Psalm 1611 says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. See, this is the great hope of Jesus, and it can be our hope as well. The path of life leads through death to everlasting joy with God. See, God has promised us the greatest blessing. He will give all of himself for all of us for all eternity. Man, is there any better news than that? Is there anything else in this, in this, in this world? We're, we're searching out to the call. We have NASA searching out through the James Webb telescope into the cosmos because people are convinced that there is a life beyond our planets. You have people giving themselves day after day after day. They are workaholics. They are serving at the altar of their desk day after day after day. You have people sacrificing the worship of the Lord on the Lord's Day, day after day, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, so they can do their sports activity 
my friends, if you will not be satisfied in God, you will not make him a priority in your life. If you consistently forsake the, the fellowship of God's people, you need to ask yourself some hard questions. What is the priority? Is it that event? Is it that thing that you're doing on the Lord's Day that's more important than gathering together with God's people whom you'll spend all eternity with? And the priority is you're only spending an hour, maybe two hours. But for many Christians, they can't even make it this priority. My friends, when you cut yourself off from the means of grace, from the preaching of God's word, from the fellowship of God's people face to face, because the New Testament Christians, they didn't have smartphones. They did not have iPads. They did not have laptops. They didn't have any devices. They didn't have podcasts. And by the way, I want to say something. I'm not your pastor. Some of you know that. Some of you appreciate when I say that. I'm not your pastor. I'm not even a pastor. I'm a Bible teacher. I love to teach the Bible. I love to help people grow in, in knowledge of the Bible and of the grace of God and to, to point them to the means of grace. But we at Servants of Grace are a resource ministry. What you need is you need the fellowship of God's people. You need to have biblically qualified male pastors. You need to participate in the sacraments. Guess what? I'm not doing communion here on this podcast. I'm not. We're not doing baptism. This isn't a church. I'm not your pastor. That doesn't mean, though, that you can't appreciate, that you can't learn from this podcast. I hope that you do. So I'm not saying that. But I am saying that if you're going to be satisfied, one of the key components to being satisfied in God is to do life with God's people together in the church. Over 50 times in the New Testament, we're told to one another each, each other. And these one another passages, they fill out what it means to care for one another, to love one another, to serve one another, to do life with one another. And friends, this is so important because as we grow in our knowledge of the Bible, we need one another. We need ironing, sharpening iron. Titus 2 ministry, older men instructing younger men, older women instructing younger, younger women. You see, we have a need of one another. And you know what? The good news is the resurrected Christ is the one who is the head over the church. He's the one that gives us true and genuine joy. He's the one that empower, indwells us and empowers us through the Holy Spirit. He is our hope and he is our joy both now and forever. So don't neglect, as Hebrews 10 talks about, don't neglect the gathering together. We come together on the Lord's Day on Sunday to worship the risen Christ. Don't neglect Monday through Saturday reading and studying and memorizing and meditating and applying the word to your life. Don't, don't neglect working hard for God's glory at your job where he's placed you to be an ambassador, to be an instrument of his word in a, in a world that is going because where people are seeking after their own pleasure. And Jesus calls you to be salt and light. Speak the truth in love, brothers and sisters. And where you've failed in this regard, we have a good king. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Why? Because verse, 1 John 2, 1 through 2 very clearly tells us he is, he is our advocate. He is our mediator. He is our advocate before God. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 tells us very clearly that Jesus is our high priest. And so we can trust him. We can take him at his word. 
because there's joy, true joy. And remember, what is the Spirit doing in us? Galatians 5, 22 through 23 very clearly tells us that one of the fruits of the Spirit is, is joy. One of the things that the Holy Spirit is through the Word that you read, that you study, that you meditate, that you memorize, that you're applying to your life, that you're hearing preached to you on Sunday. He, the Holy Spirit is taking the word that you hear, read, study, meditate, memorize, apply, and hear preached. And one of the things that he's doing in you, Paul is saying, is he's producing joy. And why? Because we serve a Christ who says it is finished. It is signed. It is sealed in the blood and the resurrection of our King. And what that means is if you don't know the Lord Jesus, you don't have genuine joy. And I would plead with you today on the basis of Acts 16.31, to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. My friends, let us find Christ to be our treasure. Let us find Christ to be our delight. He is the only one who can satisfy, and he alone is sufficient. And he alone is revealed in his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that you've given to us to open your word. We thank you that it's true. We thank you that it reveals who you are and what you're like and who we are in our sin. And we thank you for that it reveals, the scriptures reveal a sufficient Christ that is always sufficient to meet our, our great need. So I pray, Lord, that you would open eyes and ears and hearts to those who do not yet know you. And I pray for my brothers and sisters that we repent of any idolatry of failing to make you a priority in our lives and our worship on the Lord's day, that, that we would repent of any apathy, sins of omission or commission. And we just, we just confess those things to you and we thank you that you're faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Thank you for listening to the Servants of Grace podcast today. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, leave a rating on the app, and share our episode with your friends and family. If you'd like to, you can follow us on Instagram at Servants of Grace, on Twitter at Servants of Grace, or by searching Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find this podcast on the front page of our website at servantsofgrace.org.